Hi, I'm Ron Deal, president of Smart Step Families and director of Blended Family Ministries for Family Life. I want to spend a few minutes talking with you about doing marital therapy with couples in step families. This process really starts, guideline number one, is you understanding step family dynamics and the process of step family development. Unfortunately, if you don't have a good understanding of that, then you're not going to be able to really guide and direct them and help them make sense of what's going on in their lifetime. So the more you know, the better equipped you're going to be to help them. Now, this does not mean that you have to throw away your counseling theories and your style as a counselor. As a matter of fact, I like to think of it as this. You take step family understanding and dynamics and development and take those models and lay them right beside your counseling model. It doesn't replace your counseling model. It informs your counseling model. A second guideline is that step family therapy really needs to be based on expanding step family systems, not biological systems. Now, this one's kind of like the first guideline, understand step families. Far too many counselors and pastoral leaders give second family advice to step families based on biological families. They're giving the wrong advice to this family. You have to understand what's unique and different about this step family to really be able to give pointed advice to them. A third guideline is be flexible in who you see and who you work with. Sometimes you're going to work with the couple and sometimes you're going to work with the whole family unit. Sometimes you just need to see children or maybe just his children or maybe just her children. You won't know until you really begin to get to know them. So initially I suggest that you spend time just with a couple, maybe two or three sessions to hear their story, get familiar with them, and begin to make some decisions about who else, perhaps, you need to bring into the counseling process. A fourth guideline is understanding attachment, loss, and loyalty issues for children. Those three things are really important. It's hard to really impact parents if they don't understand attachment, loss, and loyalty. So, for example, you want to work to sensitize adults to these matters in their kids. They need to understand their children are dealing with loyalty conflicts as they move back and forth between homes. Sometimes the reason a child is resistant to a step-parent is because they like them, and that creates an inner problem for them. I like you as my stepmom. I'm afraid that my biological mom will be unhappy with me because I like you. That's a conflict children feel. When you help adults understand that, then you're beginning to help them parent the children better as well. Another guideline is using psychoeducational strategies as a point of intervention with step family couples. We've actually found that that is very, very effective because what it does is it gives them hope. Essentially what you're doing is you're giving them answers to their questions. For example, Helping couples understand using a crock pot to cook their family instead of a blender teaches them to relax a little bit, to understand that relationships can come together slowly over time, like a crock pot does in cooking ingredients together. But the more that the couple tries to force it and to push it, the less likely it is to happen. So when they relax, it's kind of like everybody now has an opportunity to figure out how they're going to be family with one another. Teaching them those types of things makes a big change in who they are and how they approach their family. Couples often come in frustrated and disillusioned, thinking that they should have never married. But when you provide perspective and basically answer their question, what's going on here? You are normalizing their journey. You're also normalizing their emotions. And you're telling them, it's not you. You're not crazy. This is pretty typical. I find myself saying things like, you know, you're right where I would expect you to be at this point in your family's development. Oftentimes, that's so reassuring for couples. They thought there was something wrong with them, but now they're feeling like, maybe we're okay. I say things like, of course you're frustrated. You married this man because you loved him and you cared deeply for his children, and now, as their stepmother, they don't appreciate you. They don't say thank you. You feel taken for granted. Of course you're frustrated. See, that type of thing puts words on somebody's experience and helps them to make sense of it. Maybe you say something like, yeah, you are stuck. You're stuck between your wife, you're stuck between your ex-wife, and you even have a daughter. There's three women that you're trying to please, and you can't figure out how to please all of them. That's a frustrating place to be. 
Putting words on that not only helps him to understand that experience, but it also helps his wife who's sitting in the room hearing you say those words. And she begins to have a little bit more compassion for perhaps what her husband is going through. Put words on their experience that gives them perspective and understanding about what's going on. And most importantly, it provides hope. So psychoeducation really is an important intervention. You help them understand the integration process and what to expect out of one another. When you talk about insiders and outsiders in step families, well, wow, that helps them to make sense of that. Insiders, by the way, are people who are biologically connected to one another. Outsiders are step people, step parents, step siblings, and they're trying to move towards the inside. How do they go about doing that? When you talk about that, teach them about that, it gives perspective, and now they know what to do in the future. You might spend time talking about loyalty issues, as I mentioned earlier. Parenting is another point of contention oftentimes. Show them how to be on the same team and work together as a couple. You're the biological parent. You're the step parent. What role is yours and what role is yours? As they come together and play to one another's strengths, that really makes a difference in them leading the home in an effective way and supporting their marriage as a new couple relationship. You also have to attend to the marriage. One of the things I want to talk about is some of the things that we've learned about working with couples and step families. And one of the most important things for you to know is the fear factor. That's what I've come to call it, the fear factor. How the fear of another breakup impacts couples' relationships. All couples have hurts. All couples have hurts. Injuries are really deep wounds. Those are things that have cut deep. We often find that step-family couples have injuries because it extends to the past. Those injuries may have been in a previous marriage relationship. Sometimes they go all the way to the family of origin for this, young, for this person. It's, it's an injury they've carried with them through a series of relationships. So resolving that requires forgiveness of the past and then changes in the present. Entrenched partners that are really having a difficulty with one another often have multiple injuries, multiple hurts in their past, family of origin, previous spouse, even in this current relationship. Here's what's important about understanding attachment injuries. Fear. Fear functions like a third party in a couple's relationship. It pulls them apart. It limits trust and intimacy and instead it puts up walls. We find that partners that are fearful of being hurt again, they, it blocks their engagement with their partner. It blocks their risk-taking. Here's what I mean by that. If they're not taking risks, and sacrifice is one of the things that's required of us to love. But if I'm unwilling to make sacrifices because I'm afraid if I love you, you're going to hurt me, then I don't make sacrifices. I'm not willing to serve you. I'm not willing to extend myself to you. I won't take risks. And in effect, that means I'm pulling back from you. And one of the things that results is a wall, a wall of self-protection, self-guardedness. People stick, keep to themselves rather than entrusting themselves to their partner. I heard one man say to me, you know, spouses come and go, but children are forever. What he was saying is, it's really risky to love my wife and to entrust myself to her. I'd much rather just keep my relationship with my kids strong and not take any risks there or change any rules or deal with any parenting changes because I want to keep them happy. That, I know, is going to be with me forever. See, he's got a lot of fear inside him. And we've got to try to help him work through that fear or he's going to continue to be stuck. Attachment injuries and fear limits the developing intimacy and trust in a couple's relationship. I had one gentleman who just really got angry with his wife because she had some pictures of their previous family that included her ex-husband and their children. They were family pictures. And the reason she kept them was because she wanted her kids to have access to those pictures. But for her new husband, he thought that was a statement of her having affections for her ex-husband and somehow not being committed to him. Do you see how that fear was creeping into how he interpreted that and the accusations then that he made toward her. He became a blamer. You know, he's getting critical of her. Well, fear does that and it invites those negative interpretations of what's going on. So his wife has a picture. That's pretty innocent. But in his mind, that means that she doesn't love me as much as I wish that she loved me. That creates something we call confirmation bias. When you begin to look for something and you're afraid that it might be there, 
and then all of a sudden you see it. It's because you're kind of putting it in. You're inserting it. It's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And again, that just creates walls. It pulls couples away from one another. If somebody has a never-again posture of self-protection, never will I let somebody hurt me again. Why would I risk vulnerability with my spouse? Why would I change rules with my kids? Why would I listen to what you have to say to me about parenting? Why would I do that when I'm not so sure you're going to be there tomorrow? You see how that just keeps couples apart. Really, in summary, this is the way I would say this to you. The function of fear is this. When I'm protecting me from you, there can never be an us. There can't be an us. So, marital therapy and treatment with this situation, we have to find the triggers, the things that kick in the fear for people. Then we have to try to help them work through that fear. Now notice, I don't think you just put it away. I don't think you just turn away from it and act as if it's not there. You have to find your way through the fear. You have to learn how to take a risk anyway. That's the only way you learn that it's safe on the other side. That's the only way you move couples towards one another. You can use your style or your theoretical approach. Cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, would try to create alternative scenarios. All right, so your thoughts and feelings and actions related to the fear are this, and what would it be if you didn't have the fear? What are the thoughts and what are the feelings? What would you do if you didn't have that fear? That's one way to address it. If you're a solution-focused therapist, then you're probably going to talk about, hey, when this ghost that haunts you from the past is not around, what are you doing differently? When it's not a problem, how are you acting in a way that's trusting, that's giving, that's serving? I like the pretend assignment that's a strategic approach to change. And sometimes I might even say to somebody, you know, that ghost is with you a lot. So let's just let that ghost be around for three days this week. But for four days this week, I'd love for you to just pretend that the ghost is busted. The ghost has gone away and you're not haunted by it anymore and you're free to love and give. Let's just have fun with that and see what happens. Sometimes it's amazing to have people come back at the end of that experiment and discover that, wow, I really can do that. They really do care for me. It really is okay to give myself to them. Another approach that people use sometimes is externalizing that ghost. That's where you try to take the ghost that's in them, if you will, and move it outside of them. And so you say things like, how, is it, how are you different when you're not haunted by that ghost? What do you do to keep him out when he wants to come and haunt you, but you say no? What's that like for you? Emotionally focused therapy is another approach where you try to get that person who is guarded and self-protective to soften a little bit and to engage very intentionally. And right there in session, I will coach somebody who's been haunted. I will coach them to reach, to extend themselves to another person, to give them the benefit of the doubt, for example. We have to help couples to take risk. Edmund Friedman said, risk is what confirms or disproves one's perception of reality. Until somebody disproves their own perception of reality, then they're probably going to remain stuck in their own fear box. Another intervention in marital therapy is doing forgiveness work. Sometimes the ghost and the fear is related to a pain from the past, perhaps a previous marriage relationship or maybe something going back to their family of origin. Help them to look at that, to understand the impact on them, and to do forgiveness work. You have a really good exercise in your Prepare and Rich materials that will help you walk somebody through forgiveness. Another place of intervention is to invite the current partner to become compassionate with their partner's injuries. The way I like to say it is, okay, your spouse has a ghost. How are you going to be an asset to them in busting that ghost? How can you join them in, in getting rid of that ghost? It's going to take some compassion on your part. Sometimes a partner says, you know what? I'm not responsible for that pain in their life. I shouldn't have to be paying for the sins of their previous spouse. Well, maybe that's true, but the fact is, there's a situation here and it's kind of dividing you. Are you going to come alongside them and be a supporter or are you going to be angry and critical about this? I think you'll find and they'll find that together you can bust this ghost a lot better rather than working against each other. Let me just kind of conclude this little section on therapy with some clinical observations. So when you're working with couples, you're going to have to address the fear. If you can't get past that, then they're not going to be able to move toward one another. 
Let me just share some other observations in working with couples and step families. Sometimes you'll notice that somebody is stuck and what normally works to move them toward the other person is not working. That's an entrenched situation. And typically entrenched persons have deep, deep bruises, deep fears. You may have to continue to chase what else is there that you haven't heard about yet. And until they really resolve those, maybe do some forgiveness work and really understand that part of them, you may not be able to get very far. So chase the fear and help them to understand how to move past it. Initially, connect couples around parenting matters and then work towards marital matters. Oftentimes couples come in uh, seeking help around a parenting issue, a step parenting issue. That's kind of the flashpoint for a lot of couples. Go ahead and deal with that. Address that. You probably know and realize that there's some marital stuff going on behind it. But go ahead and deal with the parenting matter first that brought them in. Satisfy that need for them. And then you can shift to dealing with more specific marital issues. Parenting impasses, I've noticed in years in working with couples, usually result from kind of a few key factors. One of them is uh, a paralyzed biological parent. Now, let me just tell you what I mean by that. If a biological parent is concerned about their children and fearful of losing connection with their kids, they may be unwilling to make changes uh, in parenting rules, for example, or follow through with discipline. Sometimes parents are worried that their children are going through more difficulty. And so in the single parent years, they may have gotten paralyzed, meaning they didn't follow through with discipline, they didn't follow through with expectations, and the kids got really used to running around doing whatever they wanted. Well, when you bring that into a step family home, let's say the biological parent and the step parent have a conversation about, you know, we really need to make the kids make their beds. You're right. Let's agree to that. And they even come to agreement on what the rule is going to be. But when it comes time to implement, that parent gets paralyzed again. Then the step parent feels like, hey, you're not supporting our decision. I feel undercut. You came in behind me and told them they didn't have to. And you can see how that begins to spin stress in their marriage. Work with that biological parent to try to understand why they've gotten paralyzed, what that's about, and how they can overcome it. They need to overcome it not only for the sake of their marriage, but they need to overcome it for the sake of their children helping their kids to learn responsibility, to understand their role in the family, and to follow through with things. Everybody benefits at that point. Other impasses I've noticed are the result of a rigid, inflexible step-parent. They may come in with some very predefined ideas of how things should go in the home. And they set out to try to make everything happen the way they want it to happen. I often see this with somebody who is themselves a biological parent. They may have raised children for a few years. Sometimes they've raised children for many years. And now they have married somebody who has younger children. They've become a step-parent. And they're going to bring in all the strategies they used with their own kids, assuming that they will also work with their stepchildren. Sometimes it works. Oftentimes it doesn't. That creates this tension between the couple. Part of this is helping the step-parent to understand you have a different place in this home, you have a different role, you have a different amount of authority in this home. Let's talk about your rules and how you think should, things should go and let's get you and your spouse on the same page before trying to implement those things. Another impasse that I've noticed happens with parents is around uh, extreme beliefs or postures and it's like maybe one person is very flexible and lets the children do what they want and come home what they want and the other parent, the parent or step parent, moves to a posture that is different from them. So the two of them are in two different places. One is very flexible and one saying no, 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 we need to hold these kids to the rules. Well the more they discuss the further and further they get away from each other that not only affects their effectiveness as parents but it impacts their couple relationship in that it creates stress and isolates them from one another. If you find they're not on the same page, you have to work toward moving them closer. Sometimes that means one parent has to do more change than the other. Sometimes that means they both have to compromise and come to the middle. You'll have to figure that out, but the point is they can't really lead from a position of disharmony. And finally, Sometimes when a biological parent is not making space for the step-parent, we find a parental impasse. Biological parents uh, have been raising their kids sometimes for years and years and years, and maybe they raised them for many single-parent years, and they got so used to making all the decisions 
and, uh, and setting the rules that when a step parent comes into the picture, it may be difficult for them to relax a little bit and create space for the step parent to play a part in that parenting process. It's really important that they slow down, learn how to say, you know, I'll get back to you on that. I need to go talk to my husband or wife and we'll make a decision and I'll get back to you about that. Sometimes the kids will say, wait a minute, you never had to ask anybody before. The kids kind of like, uh, kids are really good at throwing guilt trips like that sometimes. But that biological parent just needs to understand, you're right, I never had to ask anybody before, but I am asking them now because they're a part of my life and a part of our life. And I want to give them that consideration. That moves the couple closer together and strengthens them as a parenting unit. Let me just kind of wrap up this section on marital therapy by offering you some common reframes that I've found are very helpful with couples. They come in angry. You want to help them see the fear behind the anger. All they know is they're angry and hurt. Helping them to understand the fear and the desire behind the anger is helpful because that's something we can address. John Gottman said, every negative emotion is a recipe to a desire, something you wish were different. So follow the recipe. Ask somebody, you're obviously angry about that. What are you afraid is going to happen if things don't change? Well, I'm afraid that we're going to be divided, we're going to pull apart, that they're going to do this and that's going to happen, and my kids are going to go live in the other home. Whatever that fear is, there it is, right? And so what you desire is for the family to be closer, for you and your spouse to be more loving with one. Whatever that desire is, okay, that's what we need to address. Let's try to figure out how to get there rather than just dealing with anger. We've got to have a recipe toward what we want. And when you help them see that, now that's an opportunity for change. Another reframe that I find myself using many times with step family couples is from jealousy to desire. So the reason you're jealous of your spouse's time with their children, the reason that you're jealous that they have to call their ex-wife to make a decision about their children is because you desire for him to be close to you, for you to be one as a as a couple. You desire for closeness. You desire that he love you in the way that makes you feel safe and comfortable in the relationship. Jealousy obviously is a negative emotion, but when you reframe it towards desire, again, like before, we're finding the, the recipe, the path. What is it that we need to build? Now we can work on strengthening that. Another reframe, we're getting nowhere to you're right where I would expect you to be. I've often found that that is such a relief for couples when they hear me say, hey, you're right where I would expect you to be. They feel like they're failing. They've come into your office for help. They feel like we're getting nowhere. And then you say, you know what? You're right where I expect you to be. You're doing just like all the other couples that I see at this point in their marriage that have been married for this many years and have this many kids or whatever their circumstances are. And it helps them to go, okay, okay, I guess there's hope for us. Now, what do we do about it? That's a really effective reframe for them. And then finally, reframe from you're feeling unimportant to you have a critical role in this family's success. It just feels like you're rejected. It feels like you're unimportant to the kids. But let me tell you, you are really, really important. Now let's talk about the role you can play. That may be the role you can't play, but let's talk about the role you can play. Then she moves to a place of being a helper to the process rather than feeling defeated by the process. I really believe you can make a difference in the lives of couples and step families. It starts with you having a good understanding of their issues, what those issues might be, and of step family development so that you can teach them and help them to understand those things. But then moving them through fear and taking risk and moving toward one another as they deal with all the things that are going on around them that gives them hope and it gives them answers. You can make a difference in the life of a couple.